Hello. Hello, everyone. Good to see you. Uh, we're having a bit of a, just a very, I would say, slight snowfall. So, hopefully it's not going to affect the visibility. Um, well, it could have been worse, so that's all right. Please let me know if the sound is okay, if the video is okay. Hi, Joanne, Jenny, Susie, Cindy, Deanna, good to see you, Karen. Thank you, Susie, thank you so much. So I'm joining early as usual. So if by any chance there is uh, any of the Voyagers, thank you, Jenny. Who uh, who hasn't seen part one? Please let me know. I will try to fill you in a little bit. Of course, I will start the tour with a bit of a recap, of course. But you might have some questions that I might not really um, uh, mention. So I'll be happy to answer some of them right now when we have time. Uh, well, I think it's one of the, I would say, iconic views of St. Petersburg. We are on the Nevsky Avenue. But we're not going to stay here for <laughs> for long. So, uh, Kelly, you didn't see part one. So, part one was basically about filling you in about the, uh, let's say, some uh, prehistory to the Second World War. Um, well, obviously, in the context of the Soviet Union, of Leningrad, and I mentioned a few things like why uh, the Nazi troops managed to come that close to Leningrad, actually to the territory which is now included in the city limits, how they managed to come so close in less than uh, one and a half months. So, so the reasons for those for that would be that Two years before that, in 19, well, just before the war, there was a pact, there was a treaty between the Soviet Union and, uh, and Germany, so the non-aggression pact, um, Molotov-Ribbentrop pact, you might also heard of it. So, and Stalin would think, would hope that this uh, treaty would basically prevent Hitler from attacking the Soviet Union, um, which obviously we know wasn't wasn't exactly like this, right? Then uh, uh, just uh, a decade before that, in 1930s, uh, Stalin started the purge and would send to uh, labor camps uh, to exile and basically commission to uh, execute loads of people, intelligentsia, you know, like the, like the engineers, like the uh, intellectual, uh, intellectuals than people of uh, like noble, so those few that were left from noble origin, from noble families, and also people of the military. So by the time the war started, Russia had lost about, well, maybe one third, one quarter of the military elite that could have been extremely helpful in stopping uh, Hitler. Okay, give me a second. We might need, I might need to actually cover my microphone a little bit because the wind is strong and it's only getting stronger. Please let me know if it's muffled. I'll try to readjust. At some point, I might need to put the mask on, but just keep me posted, okay? Hi, everyone. John, good to see you. Paul, Gail, Audrey. I'm basically filling in in more details uh, those who didn't have a chance to join me for part one, so I'm just explaining some of the things. Just obviously, we'll start with the recap, but, you know, the recap might also take <laughs> a long time. And so th there's so much I, I'm, I'm going to share with you tonight. And uh, so tomorrow is going to be part three. So the part scheduled for today Actually, I decided to divide it into two parts, not to make it too, I would say, uh, probably, um, I didn't want really to rush, but it's still, it might take me a while. Thank you, Gail. 
Uh, thank you, Karen. Yes, uh, my son is all right. Hopefully, luckily. <laughs> well, you never know. Um, well, his PCR test came negative, so everybody is all right. So far, so good. But I definitely, that scared me a lot. Well, like any parent, I was scared. Yours has COVID. Oh, Karen, I'm so sorry to hear that. Well, I hope everything is under control. Sending my healing vibes, you know. I'm not sure how powerful they might be. And uh, <laughs> in what amount you will get them delivered. But I'm sending you as many as possible with the quickest VIP DHL delivery all the way. So the premium package for Karen. Fine. Oh, yeah, your vaccination doesn't really uh, help much. Well, it helps. Yeah, but it, it doesn't say that you're not going to get it. So I've been vaccinated. I just recently had my booster jab, but I still know I'm not like fully protected. So <sighs> well, now he believes, right, Karen? Now everybody believes. Yeah, well, I think this can be helped. So we just you have to face it, be ready, and take any precautions available. So, that's it. So, uh, that was about, let's say, the little introduction. That's why the, um, so it was just one of the few reasons why the Nazi troops managed to come that close. One more reason. Again, I'm not, when we haven't started yet. Uh, haven't started yet, so I'm just basically telling those who didn't have a chance to join. Um, uh, Russian army, Soviet army wasn't, let's say, uh, very well equipped exactly for the same reason. So because Stalin didn't want to admit uh, the fact that Hitler had been preparing to attack the Soviet Union and Stalin wouldn't believe any of the information passed uh, by the Soviet spies. Uh, and eventually, the people uh, from the KGB just stopped uh, informing Stalin because they basically were scared of their own lives. Uh, because Stalin would go into fury, you know, when another uh, secret note had been passed to him. So, yeah, I showed you the, the document, uh, well, the, the photograph of the document with the Stalin note, where he basically used a swear word. To, to just express how he feels about all those messages. Uh, hi, Crystal. Hi, everyone. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for joining. Lorraine from New Zealand. <laughs> Amazing. You're here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, Joanne. Good to see you too. Great. So, and uh, it took a while for the Soviet, um, well, let's say military industry uh, to just back up and to prepare and to start um, producing some really good uh, weapons uh, of different kinds of batteries, air defense batteries and all sorts of things. Um, and this started, we're going to talk about uh, the equipment the Russian army had, but not in this tour, because this tour is mostly about the people, the locals, the everyday life. How people would go about their usual things, you know, their daily routines. Because you had to survive, right? You had to survive. I will try my hardest not to not to make this tour uh, a super sad one. And uh, I will try very hard not to not to not to cry, which basically uh, which is which is possible because well I just turn on my working mode and I'm just a talking head and trying not to be too emotional, but I can't really promise that. Thank you, Jared. Uh, this, uh, yeah, I'm trying to stay as unbiased as possible. And uh, I would say that um, nowadays, the Russian society is sort of uh, split uh, into two camps. Those who, well, the minority misses the Soviet times, and some of them even think that Tokyo Stalin had done a lot, and it was him who, uh, uh, let's say, won the war. 
partially it is so because the people fought in the name of Stalin. But you have well, we have to we have to call spade a spade, and there are many, let's say, comments to that, right? But obviously, the biggest part, and people around me, uh, in my uh, basically my circle, well, we obviously understand um, how things were, and uh, we do not agree, and we do not agree with with that. But it's history, so. So what we can do with history, but only learn from it, right? So learn from mistakes, learn from the, uh, learn from success. So some examples. So yeah, that's basically it. And I appreciate your tolerance. I appreciate your understanding and your um, your comments. I am in constant awe about how educated you voyagers are and how much you know about Russian history and some names and some episodes that are not normally taught in like European or American schools. So this is amazing. Oh, hi, Richard. Good to see you. Hi, Christopher, Lane, Deborah. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. It's so good to see you. Good, good afternoon. Well, it's evening here already, dark as usual. So our tour is scheduled for 7 p.m. local time, which is June tip plus three. Hello, hello, everyone. Long time no see. Oh, hello. Hello, Aya. Uh, certainly the sound is a bit muffled. Well, Susan, that's exactly why I ask you to keep me informed of, because uh, it's a bit windy here, and I've been trying to cover my microphone, but... Just keep them posted if it gets muffled or if it gets, I don't know, if it gets too loud or too too quiet. Just keep me posted, okay? Thank you, Judy. My son is doing all right. But it was a good thing to do to stay with him for a few days. So, that's, thank you so much. It's all good. Yes. Thank you, Susan. Of course. So, we are, we're expecting some heavy snowfall tonight. Uh, another storm, uh, well, like a snowstorm, nothing unusual though, but it might affect the quality of the tour, so please keep me informed of how, how it goes. <laughs> yeah, Karen, exactly, exactly. Thank you, Dolores, thank you so much. Thank you, Aileen, thank you, thank you. We have about a few minutes. If you have any any questions before we start, I'm here to answer them. So unlike the let's say some some other of my tours, so these tours are quite well. Obviously, I'll start with the recap, but there is so much information I'm sharing in every tour. So it might be, it might need, it might require some more clarification in case you don't understand if you think that like you can't get the dots connected. So there's definitely going to be a Q&A. The big Q&A is going to be in the end of the tour. And I'll be happy to answer the questions that would require more elaboration. So um, if you have like really big questions not related to this and that particular thing I am talking about, so that would be really great if you could repeat the questions when the big Q&A in the end of the tour uh, starts. This is the, well, it's taken me a while to prepare this, uh, this, these tours. And uh, I should tell you that it's not just uh, a month. It's not the first time I'm running this tour, but the first time I'm running these tours, um, I'm running these tours like virtually for the first time. And it's, a whole different level of preparation and planning so it's taken me a while and uh, i am negotiating lots of things for this tour so hopefully it's gonna work so keep your fingers crossed hi rene uh this must be crazy late for you there thank you so much for joining thank you so it's time to begin uh hello everyone welcome to st petersburg my name is Anna. I'm a licensed guide to this amazing city. 
but this time it's not really about the glamour it's not about the awesome architecture well that too but let me flip the camera you might actually hear the clocks over here so we are on the Nevsky Avenue thank you Audrey thank you everyone so let me step a little backwards so you can see all of it so this tour is about, it's the episode two of my Siege of Leningrad series. And uh, I'm taking you to some really old places where we've been to already and to some new places and plan to take you to even more locations. Let me flip the camera here as well on the count of three, one, two, three, because I want you to see this, this tower as well. Um, and I will start with a beautiful view because I want all of us to think that this couldn't have existed. This could have been destroyed completely, could have been wiped away from the face of the earth. Let me flip the camera back on the count of three. One, two, three. <sighs> Thank you, Rini. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining. So we could have lost it all had the Nazi army invaded uh, well luckily they only managed to to come very close so less than 20 kilometers well around 20 kilometers to the city of Leningrad, which is the soviet name of st petersburg so uh, today is the part two again so the the quick recap the war started in summer on june 22nd right with the uh, with the barbarossa the Barbarossa operation, and it was very quick. And uh, the Nazi army would be moving very fast. They could really pass 50 kilometers, like more than 30 miles a day. And already by the end of August, they were very close. They were in the outskirts of Leningrad. I would like to show you one map that I, well, I, um, you know, I use maps a lot because there is nothing I can explain without them in this regard. So this is the map. Over here you see the pink territories. They, those are free territories, not besieged. All the other territories of Leningrad and the Leningrad region were occupied. So with their uh, three army groups uh, from the south, you see army group north is the one of the army groups, about well, a bit less than one million people. Uh, they were they started to attack, they were really aiming at Leningrad. But later on, closer to the fall, uh, so the Nazi, um, the Nazi com commanders, they decided to, do, uh, let's say, well, to make, to split, so that, to, to divide the uh, army group north into a few divisions and take part of the troops to attack Moscow. Moscow will be a little bit below in this map. You also he see here the Finnish army, so I'm sorry to mention that, but well, I mentioned it in part in part in part one is that because of the Winter War or the Soviet Finnish War, um, after which the Soviet Union annexed a big part of the former Finnish territory, so the Finnish army was um, well allied with the Nazi army and attacked the city from the north. And this is what you see on on September eighth, the siege started so over here i really need the third hand but okay uh, let's put it like this so here you see a small town this is the outskirts of st petersburg this is now oh hold on this is so cold so my, i think my screen is not exactly feeling the way it should feel it's not really uh, very uh set sense of probably working the best way so these are the outskirts of the city this is exactly where the catherine palace where the amber room is nowadays it's less than 40 minutes drive from the downtown to Tsarskaya selo this is how close the army the, uh, the nazi army managed to come uh, i will talk more about the other free territories but we have to we have to keep in mind that in the in the very heart of the image you see the leningrad so this is the territory that was besieged. By that time, by September 8th, the, the city population was a bit more than 3 million people. Uh, and uh, so the bombs started falling on the city. <laughs> thank you. 
thank you, Michelle. Thank you for understanding. Yeah, it's probably it's getting a bit cold for my hands to, um, yeah, to use my phone and the and the <laughs> better cover the mic. Okay, so let me do that. Okay, let me do that. Is it better now? Please let me know. I'm covering it with my scarf, but I'm not sure if it's really. Oh, great. That's great. So, um, more than 3 million people got all of a sudden blocked. They were blocked in the city. And the city was bombed heavily. I would just, uh, from here, we, we are setting off to another location. But before we go, I want to show you something. So, this is, you see, this is the Gastine Dwar, the shopping mall, the very first um, department store, let's put it this way, department store that works, has been working since the last quarter of 18th century. In the Soviet times, it also was the shopping mall. I want you to see this. The picture is taken a bit from, uh, from afar, but it's what you see. You see the tanks, you see that the tower, the Duma tower, the watchtower is a little bit of the telegraph tower, because the first telegraph was exactly there in that tower. So it's a bit it's partly destroyed. So this is just the very first, very first days of siege, of the siege. <laughs> well, yes. And there's one more image. And I would like to start from here. So just, it's a bit graphic. It's not about blood, but I want you to see this. So I'm taking you to those horrendous times now. It's just in the blazes. Because the Gastina Dwar, so this department store was <laughs> bombed heavily. Here, uh, just apart from the shops, there were several uh, publishing houses and some other offices. And hundreds of people would die here just with one, with one shelling. Hundreds, hundreds of them, and you see it. So, and I'm taking you... Uh, well, to this journey, to those horrendous days, and I will try to keep it on a like a, a bit a positive note, if that's really possible. But I will try. You can't see or hear anything, Ayad. Uh, maybe a refreshing might help. Uh, well, if you can't hear me, that's I'm not really of use here. Maybe anyone could could just uh, advise Ayad to refresh. Yes, well, it's great. Thank you so much for letting me know. And right now, I'm taking you to the Art Square, a fine Art Square. And many of you remember this area. We've been here many a time, but I've never gotten the chance to tell you, well, uh, the entire story of extremely important thing, the Siege Symphony uh, that was premiered here in the besieged city, exactly, exactly here, in this yellow building over there. Yeah, well, I, uh, hope it, I hope it works for you now. Maybe there's also uh, the mute button that you just have to, have to click. Oh, it's a shame, it's not working. So, you see, so today we're going to cover just some of the places that we've been to and some we haven't seen. But it's, it's like this about the siege. The siege was everywhere. So the, the traces, the memories, uh, even the memorial plaques and some other monuments, they are everywhere. And it's just, there's so many layers in one of the same place that I would say it's, well, I always mention the siege, but so today we're going to focus about well exactly on this period. Uh, if you have if you haven't seen this, these places before my previous tours, you haven't seen many of my tours. Well, feel free to ask questions. But we are in the very old area. This is mid 19th century uh, area of Saint Petersburg, one of the biggest and most beautiful squares of Saint Petersburg. Uh, it's called Fine Art Square or Art Square because every building here is about art in this or that way. Well, even this building of a five-star hotel, Run Hotel Europe, is also a work of art, for sure. The magnificent architecture and the culture is probably one of the things 
that saved people, that helped people to survive. Mashmore, there is no such thing as a central monument, but there's one, really big one. I'm planning to take you there, but not just now. Uh, but the small monuments are really everywhere. Really, really everywhere. You just have to know where they are. You just have to find them. And here we are, about culture. It's about, so people were starving. I will, I will tell you later about how people would find food, how they would get by, how they would make sure their, their families, their children had enough. Well, they never had, but at least something. But we start with culture. So this is the memorial plaque. It says that exactly here in the building of the Philharmonics, I will show you the building from, from afar. Well, is it bumpy for everyone or just for Ayat? Please let me know. Okay, good here. Well, I am very sorry that you're experiencing this. So exactly here in this building, the, the premiere of the Stitch Symphony by Dmitry Shostakovich was premiered on the 9th of August, 1942. And here we have the flowers. Carnation is the traditional flower used in burial ceremonies, in mourning, in mourning ceremonies, it's traditional. So, and they are always here. I don't remember a day without, without carnations here. And just a few days ago, a few, well, about less than a, about a week ago, there was a big celebration in the city. Uh, there were about the lifting of the siege, which happened on January 27th, the, the, the complete lifting of the siege on the 27th of January. 1944 that's when it happened and we are now in 1941 right so 1941 september 8 this is when the siege started uh fraser hello yes shostakovich was on the cover of the time magazine and i will get to that just just very soon just about now so the fine art square that's the monument to alexander pushkin the prominent russian poet Luckily, he lived and he died before, before that. So this is the building of the State Philharmonics. So the Siege Symphony. So when the siege started, Dmitry Shostakovich was in St. Petersburg. He lived uh, not far from here. He was, a, he was a prominent musician by that time. And uh, when the siege started, he, just like many other people in the city, uh, he tried to go So this is Dmitry Shostakovich. He worked in a fire brigade. So people would be uh, spending, like, well, well, like uh, people would be on duty on the roofs of uh, most of the, of the buildings because apart from just shelling, just bombs, the Nazi would be dropping highly inflammatory, like bottles with highly inflammatory substances. They would be heavy. They would normally break the roof, and then uh, so uh, like the bottles would break, and that fluid would just they would start a fire and this kind of brigade uh, they would help like the anti um, let's say anti-aircraft brigades they would help prevent numerous buildings in St. Petersburg or Leningrad from burning down so exactly this otherwise we wouldn't have had any of these buildings and so Shostakovich was basically the the firefighter and exactly that this is him on the cover of the time magazine so he it, it wasn't just a propaganda that's exactly that's 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 the truth and he was evacuated closer to the end of uh, 1941 he was evacuated to the town of Kuybyshev which is now called Samara it's in the let's say closer to the south of um, of Russia and uh, by that time, the first part of the Siege Symphony had been ready. But so the second part was finished already in evacuation. 
And when it was finished in the end of the 1941, it was, it was ready. It was ready. And the question was only when. Let's just walk around a little bit around the square. It's, it's a beautiful location. And again, just let's think of how we could have lost it all. Um, the question was how the second part of the final score would be delivered. But eventually it happened. So the aircraft would deliver. Um, uh, the aircraft would deliver uh, the, uh, the final score. Uh, and this would be the conductor, Carl Elias Beck. Sometimes it's Elias Beck, but no, it should be Elias Beck. So this was the, the conductor, the chief conductor. He was given the final score and he was, he was in shock because when he saw the final score of the Siege Symphony, Yes, Carol, Shostakovich was just one of them, but yeah, well, it was just one of the greatest, greatest uh, composers and musicians. Uh, so when Elizabeth saw the huge final score, he realized that it would, it would require about 100 of musicians in the orchestra. And by that time, there were only 15 members of the orchestra alive. Because the very first months of the siege, especially the winter months, were the months with the biggest toll. So people, so about, you just, just think of it. So altogether, in 872 days, that's exactly how long the siege would last, uh, more than 1 million people died in the besieged Leningrad. And in the very first months of uh, of the siege starting from let's say November so the, when the cold reel started from November till February uh, about 500,000 people died because the temperatures would drop up to 30 minus minus around minus 40 degrees Celsius so only 15 people so LS Beck said no it's not going to happen it, we're, we're not going to make it but they did uh, let me show you so these will be the uh, the advertisements of the Seventh Symphony by Shostakovich. And uh, so the rehearsals started. Uh, they would have to recall the, the musicians from the battlefield. They would have to, uh, you know, they would even have to resuscitate some of the musicians. There were many cases when, um, so the rehearsals were scheduled. Uh, and normally the rehearsals would last for about three hours but they would have to make breaks to take breaks every 15 minutes because people were very weak the the ratio was so scarce 125 grams of bread in that winter i will show you the images later on but it was just bread and nothing more and people and there was no public transport there was no electricity there was no illumination there was no electricity nothing so people had to come on foot with their instruments, with their heavy instruments, and and they tried to play music. So no wonder that there were many cases. Oh, thank you, Punkita. So there were many, many cases when uh, a musician just 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 won't show up, and when Elizabeth asked, "So where is so I don't know where is the violin?" Uh, and they would say, "Oh, where is the drummer? He's there in the morgue." And there, there, there's, this is a story, this is a real story from the memoirs of Elias Beck uh, that he sent uh, a few musicians to check whether the drummer was there in, in the morgue. And he was, but he was alive. He was just so weak that people thought mistakenly that he had been dead. So they exactly uh, brought him back to life. Uh, Elias Beck commissioned, well, he ordered to uh, double the ratio and that's how they they managed uh, they managed to to arrange everything. So originally the um, originally uh, so the date would be different. It would be scheduled for springtime and summertime, but they had to reschedule it, and they did. So eventually they rescheduled it for August um, in 1942. So exactly on that day. Uh, Adolf Hitler planned to take over the city uh, and arrange a huge celebration party. Uh, well, just to, just to celebrate the <laughs> the taking over 
of Leningrad. So he even printed them out. The big party was supposed to take part in Astoria Hotel, but it, it didn't happen. So instead, the uh, Nazi troops would have to spend, well, they, they had to spend cold winter and many of them would also die. So the army group North had a huge toll, had a, a huge death toll. So, and they would hear what we are going to hear. So, um, a little bit before the August premiere uh, in here in the besieged city, and it would be sold out completely. So, uh, there would be a premiere in the free territory uh, in Moscow, and then the full final score would be taken to Tehran. And then from there, it would be taken all over the world. In summer, in June and July, there would be premieres in London, uh, in the Royal Albert Hall. There would be premiere in the NBC um, uh, Symphony Orchestra in the US, and a few more, and a few more premieres. This is exactly how uh, Dmitry Shostakovich ended up on the cover of the Time magazine. And uh, right now, I would like you just, I, I would like to, uh, to uh, switch a very short passage, a very short part of the symphony. The symphony lasts for about 80 minutes. And you can imagine how people would, how, how the musicians felt, how they managed to, uh, to go through all of it. I would like to show you some, some of the images before I switch it on. So I'm just looking at it on my phone. Just give me a moment, I've prepared so much for you. So that's, that's exactly the footage of the concert. Uh, and you see people, so there is no, so the electricity, so there was, um, there was this some electricity by that time. So finally, uh, the Soviet army managed to provide the electricity. It would be switched on for a limited time during the day. And you can see there is no central heating. People are wearing their coats and hats. And you see that. I remember reading, um, I read, well, I looked through the memoirs of the wife of Elias Beck, and she mentioned that they spent the last potato to starch his shirt because it was supposed to look, to look dapper for a concert. Okay, let me just switch it on if you don't mind. And from there, we will, we will go to the next spot. Well, it, it's taken me some time to tell you the story, but I think it's, it's important because this was also aired to the front line and the Nazi troops could hear that. So did they stop bombing? They didn't, but exactly for the, these 80 plus minutes, the Soviet army started the, uh, the fire, the preventive fire to prevent the Nazi, Nazi aircraft come anywhere close to the downtown so that the uh, the stage symphony would be premiered without a hitch, and it did. Okay, I'm switching it on. Please uh, give me feedback if you can actually hear any of it. So hold on a moment. Well, just a very, just a very, very short passage. Hold on. I just want to show you the, so which piece I'm using. This was, uh, this was um, released a few years ago. So the Mariinsky Orchestra uh, with uh, Gergiev. So they recorded and released a very good, very good uh, Siege Symphony recording. Highly, highly recommended. That was one of my most favorite episodes. Uh, well, I'm just wondering how people who had, well, probably about 400 grams of bread a day that had to walk to work 
Even Carl Eliasberg had to be dragged to the rehearsals in the sledge because he had no physical strength. He couldn't really cope just walking. So eventually he would be moved to a hotel very close to the, to the spot. But how, where, where did they find the strength? Where did the breath had the strength to, to play this? So, well, Fraser, I'm sure you know a lot about, uh, about Shostakovich. Yes, it's, it's unimaginable. Absolutely, Richard. Absolutely. So I hope that after this tour and after maybe some other tours on the siege, you would like to, to give it a listen. So 80 minutes, but knowing the story, like looking through the images, it might really mean a lot. And we could, well, it could resonate with us. Well, it's, it's about art, right? So I'm here, I've taken you to the, to the doors of the musical comedy theater. Uh, it's just next to the Philharmonics. And well, sorry, the snow is getting stronger, but hopefully you can see everything. As you'll see, this is the art square. It is absolutely true. So the theaters, museums, and this would be one of the theaters that would be working throughout the siege. I'd like to show you a few, a few images. So it wasn't the only theater. And why? Because, well, you can imagine there was no food, but people would have to go to work because other, otherwise there was nothing to live for and they needed money because the, the food, the bread that, the, that was available to them, it was only available for money. It wasn't given, uh, it wasn't given for free. Let me show you some of the photographs over here. Well, by the way, this is just one more photograph. This is the line to the Philharmonics. So, and people would stay, stand in lines. Yes, yes, still, exactly. Uh, it's, it's, it's freezing, but this is all right. This is all right, thank you so much. This is really um, no big deal. Just a few more images. And so the music, uh, the, the, the theater of music comedy, <laughs> just have a look how much snow we've got here. I'm looking for the photographs of people standing in lines just to get, to, just to buy their tickets. And I've prepared so many for you. So, uh, there were 13 premieres of uh, different performances. Can you imagine? 13. And people would come, they would sit just just uh, just need their clothing in their coats and listen and listen to uh don't listen to the music pieces uh and uh, enjoy the art because there was no food people had to people had to get by well uh, i'm trying to find the images on my phone and i will find them just so many of them but we carry on so and i wanted to to take you to the spot, it's, it's it, again, we, we haven't been here before, but actually we are very close to the Nevsky Avenue. And there is one place that I always pass by and I just, I've always wanted to take it there, but there was no really, um, there was no reason to take you there, but now there is. I want to take you to the tunnel. It's called the tunnel of a, of a shopping center. And maybe there I'll be able to find some images on my phone. So I'm taking you to the tunnel. Please let me know if, if the connection uh, gets worse. Well, I tested it a couple of times and it was good. So we are in the tunnel of the Passage shopping mall. And I've taken you here because it is definitely a tunnel. Please let me know if you can hear me. I put I put my mask on. Good. Thank you so much. And I've taken you here because here in this tunnel, not only workers of the department store called Passage, but also the people who would be passing by managed well had a chance to hide from bombs. And here we have the memorial plaque. It's in Russian, but it says here. So here, this is to praise the memory of people who died uh, at the battlefield 
against the Nazi army uh, who fought for the freedom of the motherland. Well, this is this will be the translation. And also here in this tunnel, and you can see some images, but they are images of, as of the 19th century, but it looked almost the same. It was used for trade. It was also used to store stuff and some food in the Soviet times. Uh, and exactly here, the workers of the shopping mall and just the passers-by could hide. So they, this, this was a very good shelter. You're surprised to see English sign under Russian. Where, which one? Where is the, where is the uh, English sign? Well, normally, yes. Normally, uh, let's say the, mar the, uh, the marketing strategies are to name things uh, in English. So when, when you say Peter's visit, you'll be surprised to see so many English captions, you know, of everything. And um, I would say that it's less common to see something in Russian, let's say the, the name of the shop, for example, and some signs. So the trade, that's how the marketing works, I would put it this way. So yes, obviously, Valerie, in London, uh, yes, you could find a shelter uh, in, in London in the, um, in, the, in the tube, right, in the, in the subway. But the thing is that the subway in Russia would appear only after the war, exactly in 1945, the Stalin commissioned to start building the uh, metro. So that's, that was, um, it was planned before the war, but the war started and plans changed. So as we go to the next spot, I need to cross here. So just give me a moment. It's getting a bit slippery too. Thank you so much, everyone, for the tipping. Much appreciated. So, uh, as we walk, I promise to tell you more about how people, how people survived. And if I find the images of people in the theater, well, because they are there, but I have about 150. I will, I will provide them just in a while. So, how, how did people survive? What did they eat? That's a good question. So when, when the siege started, um, well, let's say when the war started, the card system was initiated. So people that went to work, they were employed, they would be given the cards, they would be paid money, just salary, and they would, would be given cards. I will have a few, a few images of them. Well, for example, that's how the cards would look. So in every piece every square of the card it actually had the date and it had the amount of bread that uh, this this card holder um, was allowed to have and you see it's December 1941 one of the most difficult periods for for Leningrad with the temperatures minus 35 for weeks Celsius right and you can see they are very small see for each month so it has it has date it has the weight and the people who worked at factories well like um who worked especially uh for for the army right uh to produce the the ammunition the weapons and all sorts they were given well about 400 grams a bit less than 400 grams of bread the unemployed uh, and the children were given 125 grams of bread. I want to show you how, how much, well, how, how not much it was. Have a look. So this is the piece of bread. And it wasn't exactly the bread. There was only, well, probably 20 or 30% of flour, but most of it, was a sawdust with hydrocellulose. So sawdust, cellulose, flour. And what was exactly hydrocellulose? It, it was basically to, to give more weight, to, to, make, to make the piece of bread, loaf of bread, um, more heavy, but it wouldn't give any, any nutrients. It wouldn't have exactly like zero 
um, zero good, zero nutrition uh, for the people. That was it. Can you imagine? And it stands next to the small, well, they, this was the makeshift lamps since there was no electricity. It, yeah, it was just like a small, like a small lamp. It would just give you very, very dim light over here. So you could probably just read the numbers on your bread card. And those cards, and what was the, uh, sorry, and that was all they got each day. Yes, and that was all they got each day. And again, so 1941, so uh, 125 grams was, was the minimum, and it would go like this up until spring. And then from then, it got easier. It got easier because uh, it was springtime. So shortly, people managed to, to grow things in every, in every available um, plot of land, like this uh, square, garden, anything like the garden over there people would grow food anywhere they could exactly really anywhere they could and it was much easier plus it wasn't that cold anymore so and the the living graders would say if you survived uh the first siege winter you, you can make it till the end you can make it to the end so we are on the manezhna square the manezh the horse riding manezh it's there so the imperial horse riding manege for the for the for the horse guards of the of the army. So 19th century architecture is exactly there, and this is just one of the squares. We were here, uh, Don, about the water. We will talk about that. No, there was not enough water, but luckily the water occupies about 10 percent of the city's territory. So people would just go to the river, make hole in the ice and take water in the buckets. But that's a, that's a, a big part of the story. And uh, tomorrow, because tomorrow we have part three of the siege series, I will take it to one of those places and I will show you some of the footages of how it looked. And uh, we were in this square when we had our, our um, uh, Christmas special tour, so the Christmas market. But I just, every time I would be here, I couldn't stop thinking about any other multiple layers of history here, just in this very small plot of land. Uh, exactly there, in that building over there, well, we're not going there, it's not really a big deal, but there was a very special person who lived in that building. He was one of those people who probably help, who helped save more than a million of lives. Uh, <clears throat> Just give me a second, I'm trying to find his portrait on my phone as well. This. He was the engineer, the engineer who helped save uh, people. So this is him, uh, Vasily Manakov. He was the army engineer. And he was one of those people who built uh, the road of life. Very few locals actually know that the person who helped save me one one million three hundred thousand lives just lived here in an ordinary residential building in the in the former communal apartment. So what is road of life? By the way, this is the uh, memorial plaque on this on the house where he used to live. But very few people actually pay attention to memorial plaques, right? Yes, Joy. Very few people ever heard of him. Yes. Well, of course, he wasn't the only one who worked uh on the project but yes 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 lynn well more than a million people died uh, one million three hundred thousand people were evacuated throughout the siege so um and in uh, let me show you the map again so the one that i used in the beginning it's a bit uneasy with the half of your hand but i'm trying hard thank you so much everyone gail Richard. yes exactly the road of life so there you go. So you see the unoccupied. So the pink, those are the free territories. And you see here, so the Lake Ladoga. And you see the, uh, this uh, blue uh, line, arch line. So when the, when, the, when the ice on the Lake Ladoga, which is the second biggest lake in Europe, um, when it froze, which happened in November already, so the road of life 
on the ice of Lake Ladoga was open. 30 kilometers, which is about 15 miles. The trucks were called polutarkas, and I showed you those pol the real polutarka, uh, so the, the truck uh, in the museum, uh, the military medical museum. So they would help uh, evacuate people from the Coca River to Cabona, just a few villages uh, from across the, um, across the lake. And uh, this spring, I am taking you along the road of life. So, so just give me time and we're going there. I have no idea how it's going to look, um, but it's going to happen. So are you in? Please let me know. It's going to be one of the hardest trips ever, but it's definitely an important trip to take. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And here we are standing by the uh, Dom Radio, the house of radio. So this was the central radio station. We also have our television center here. Well, it's one of the one of the offices. <clears throat> Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, everyone. And this building is extremely important because because of this lady, Olga Berkholz. So I was quite surprised to know that many of you actually are familiar with her name. So she was a Soviet poet and a radio announcer, Olga Berkholz. She, uh, well, she was from the that's the artistic family, and she was given a chance. She was one of the first people to be evacuated. And I should tell you, it wasn't just evacuation, it wasn't just for everyone. You had to pay hundreds and thousands of rubles to be evacuated, and there was a quorum. And he was, he was, uh, he was just uh, offered the evacuation, but she decided to stay and to work on the radio. And exactly from here, the Olga Berholt would be announcing everything, would be reading poems, reciting poems, would be uh, announcing, uh, proclaiming the number of deaths and some other news to the people of Leningrad. And this is, this is her, this is the memorial plaque. I would say it's, it's more than a memorial plaque, it's just a monument. Uh, Berkholz, uh, yeah, you would be surprised to know of how many German names uh, are there, there are. And Karl Ellersberg, by the way, he was half German, half Jewish. So you can imagine how, okay, let me, let me say how pissed Hitler was when he learned that the Sitch Symphony that symbolized just the absolutely unbeatable uh, power and the strength and the will of the Soviet people not to, not to surrender to the Nazi, how, so that, that symphony was performed by a German and a half German, half Jewish musician. That was horrible. Yes, exactly. So many names. And uh, these are just the lines of Olga Bergholz. Please let me know if you're interested in a special tour about Olga Bergholz, where I would be able to recite some of her poems. I would have to translate some of them too. So, but there is one extremely important line that probably every school kid knows of. Thank you so much. Thank you. So then it's definitely on the list. You have no idea how much I've prepared for us. So nobody is forgotten and nothing is forgotten. These are the words that every school kid knows. Every uh, St. Petersburg and let alone Leningrad school kid would know by heart. Uh, well, Anna Akhmatova is a great poet too, exactly, and there will be a separate tour about her, but uh, a bit later, closer to summertime. And here, this is the memorial plaque. Uh, it just says here, here is to the bravery, to the courage of the workers of the Leningrad radio station in the days of siege. So nowadays, the house of radio, or Dom Radio, is um, a concert hall. Um, uh, Theodor Krimpis, one of the uh, one of the prominent uh, conductors and musicians, um, is in charge um, of the project. So there's going to be a lot more concerts held, uh, tours. And I would say this building, um, it was in scaffolding for a few years. So anytime I would take it to this area, it would be in scaffolding. But luckily, just this, this fall, the restoration was completed and we can see the building in full. Did the 
uh, so Patricia, sorry, um, I'm not really getting the question. So Fraser, I'm amazed. I'm surprised that you know Anna Akhmadova. Well, again, you just, you keep surprising me all the time. You hey goers, amazing, amazing. So thank you so much for your interest in Russian culture, no matter what, and Russian history. Uh, we are uh, on the small street. We've been here many times. We had our Christmas market here. We, we dropped by because it's, it's just very close to the Nevsky Avenue. But again, there are so many more stories that I never got a chance to share with you about the siege. And again, we could have lost it all. Absolutely. Starting to read, calling my stories, Fraser. How are you handling all this? I have no idea. I, so whenever I start reading something like that or something, I, I, just, I just can't, you know? I just can't. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. <sighs> so, speaking of Lake Ladoga and the road of life, just a few things to share with you before we, we continue. I'm just, I just need about a minute before we reach the spot where I wanted to to, to, to tell more stories. So, I'm just, let me find it. Yes, there you go. So, this is exactly the road of life. So, they were lady. They would be used as, a, well, just the signalers. They would give the signals to the to the Poluturka cars, like this one. So, why Poluturka, by the way? Because Poltara means one and a half. So, exactly one and a half tons those trucks could carry. Uh, without really going, just breaking the ice and going under the ice. However, every fourth truck out of 4,000 of trucks working on the road life would go underwater. And people would sink. That's how it was. So some people would even say that it wasn't exactly the road of life, but it was a, a road of death. It was, so, it, it was like this too. But yet, it was the road of life. Well... There you go, the real footage. The thing is that we have photographs. So the number of photographs the World Archives have, uh, to photographs taken by the Soviet photographers or reporters, is nothing compared to the, the number of footages you can find from the Nazi archives. Because nearly every Nazi officer had a small camera with them. Uh, however, in the Russian front, in the, in the Soviet front, you were not allowed to take pictures. You were not allowed to paint anything because you could be a, you could be a spy. And once caught, you would be you would be sent to prison or maybe even executed. Just you know, war time. Nobody knows, right? Yes, one out of four Poluturka trucks would sink. Exactly. Well, Helen, Anna Karenin is, is also a big part of the story. Yeah, but it's a bit different story, though. So we've seen this place many times. This is the Yalise stop, right? So the luxury food store as of the beginning of the 20th century. But it's not about luxury this time. It's not about the continental goods and the first goods delivery in Russia arranged by this shop. Um, no matter how splendid it is, it's not the focus. But I want to show you how the, the facade looked. So it was the, the food store number one, uh, Gastronom Nomer so the food store. I want to show you the, um, the facade though. So uh, the facade would be covered with wooden planks. And there would be, there would be basically, I would say the information center, the information windows. So just give me a second, I want to find, I want to find those photographs. Hopefully I will. So just give me a second, please. Oh, this is so, just a moment. And people would get the information about anything from here. Um, the, the, so the news from the front line, the news from the, the news from uh, the other cities, Everything it will be there. So the information, the information windows. I'm trying to find it on the phone. Still can't, but even if if I can't find it, I will 
I will share it with you, so don't worry. I will share it with you on the boom on the, um on the page on the Facebook, so it will be there. Don't worry. Uh, and the, and the and the shop will be closed, so it will be closed. Um, it would uh, later on it would open that there would be really nothing there. So only bread you could find again if you had money. Uh, the, the, the 125 grams of bread would cost about one ruble. 70 kopecks or like one dollar 70 cents the average salary was starting from 150 to um uh talking into a scarf uh not exactly sure is it better now but my my, my microphone was really really deeply <laughs> burrowed in the scarf i'm so sorry <laughs> yeah okay well hopefully it's better now and i want to show you this but from around the corner, from the archway, just there, there was a door. Uh, there is not this door now. And uh, every hour, at a certain time, some people would come. And they would, so the door would open, and there they would be given food, like proper food, fresh meat, fresh fish, cupcakes. Well, like pastries and whatnot. Those were the elite. Those were the essential elite that helped. Um, well, let's say those were the, the, they helped protect the city, like the top engineers of uh, several uh, plants, several factories working for the for the battlefield. Those would be the the uh, let's say the top managers uh, of a few institutions. It would be the head of the medical facilities, heads of the medical facilities, and some professors. So they would actually get a very <laughs> no, Diana. Well, yeah, I understand what you're talking about. It looks like just it's just an average archway. We have uh, the miles, hundreds of miles of archways in in, in Saint Petersburg. So they would get good food so it's really a question whether it was a good thing to do or not but this is the truth so not there wasn't exactly equality there was never such thing as equality and uh, well it's hard it's hard to judge so we try not to judge but there was the extreme hunger there was a horrible hunger in leningrad and people would die from hunger and some people would have double of uh, the double ratio and some people very few but they would have they would have everything so that's uh, that's not easy to talk about it's not really easy to talk about it but this is true this is true uh just a few more things over here just to talk about hold on a moment i want to show you the kitties. So the kitties, we talked about them many times. But the thing is, so one kitty is there. His name is Yelisei. So maybe I can zoom it in over here. So his name is Yelisei. So the kitty is there. And the other kitty is there. These are one of the smallest monuments you can find in St. Petersburg. Well, you know about the hermitage cats, right? So they helped save the, the royal palace, the winter palace from mice and everything. But, and this is the Vasilisa. So the girlfriend of <laughs> Yelisei. There you go. This is the Vasilisa cat. This is her. And uh, so I told you quite a lot of times that cats with this, their sixth sense, they could predict bombing, and that was the case. However, by spring 1941, cats, dogs, any do every domestic pet just disappeared from Leningrad for obvious reasons, right? So they were eaten. And this is when rats came in, and they would destroy the scarce resources uh, of the food that would be... Uh, supplied through the road of life they would attack people they're the weak ones that could not resist they could not protect themselves they would eat corpse 
they would just eat the bodies, the dead bodies, and the bodies would be laying everywhere. So there were many cases when well, this person walks and person falls, I'm so sorry, and person dies. And nobody rushes up to pick them up because people have no strength. Because if you if you stop for a moment, if you just if you just spend a little more of your effort, this could be the last effort you could ever take. And there were many cases like oh, exactly here. So there were several bodies laying. I'm not, I'm not going to show you photographs, but you can you can find them if you wish. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. So a man who was about 40 years of age, he just fell, and there was like water here, and his body froze into the ground, and it was there till springtime, and only in springtime, just to prevent the epidemics. The body was picked up and carried away to one of the crematoria. And that's how it was. And it, it, let's say in the beginning of the siege, like it was hard, it was unbearable for people to see. But at some point, people got used to it. And it was just just the episode of their everyday life. I'm so I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to mention this, but we just we have to. Sometimes we have to face the truth, but I'm not really, I'm not really giving you the, the most horrible stories, no. And probably the last part for today, which is on a good note. This part, you, you, you just, you, you most probably, you would just, you would have passed by. Everybody would have passed by. But just here, where the, uh, there is a, a pizza restaurant here. Uh, but the pizza restaurant uh, actually is renting the, uh, the uh, well, let's say the office. So that place was used for the hairdressers, for the beauty parlor. And this is the memorial plaque to the workers of the beauty parlor, of the hairdressers. Yes, Aya, uh, absolutely right. So let's hope it's not going to happen again. Yes, and these are the flowers, again, to remember, to honor. And you can imagine, throughout all these siege years, this beauty parlor worked. There was, so there was not much they could do, but you know that, the, that they, they could do so. The theaters were working, the concerts, uh, the concert halls, some, some, just a few theaters uh, were working, like the musical comedy theater, a few more theaters, they were working. So people would go to concerts. So people would go to Philharmonics. The Philharmonics was working too. Uh, and so people, well, people would earn money. People who went to work, they, they had money. And uh, there, there wasn't much food they could buy. So they, they had money to spend, so they would buy tickets to concerts and they would go to the, to the beauty parlor. Well, there wasn't much the girls could do, the ladies could do. So uh, if they had kerosene, so kerosene was also not easy to get, but you could get it. So just in case. So we have Starbucks here now, and this is the, the pizza place just the next door. And this is where the beauty parlor used to be. Actually, that beauty parlor um, was opened in late 19th century. And only a few years ago, uh, it will be closed for good. Can you imagine? Uh, yes, Valerie, you can find the graphic images everywhere. You can just, you just, you just, you just go, go for them and you find all sorts of things like dead children, mutilated bodies and whatnot. Yes, we can find it. So I'm not here to, I'm not here to give you nightmares. I have them already, so I don't want you to have them. But I'm here just to, well, just for us not to forget those horrible days and probably just to be even more thankful to what we've got. And well, who am I to tell you stories about the, tell you the stories about the Second World War? Many of you, many, many of of our families, our grandmothers, grandfathers, parents, they were there. So who am I to tell you this? I'm just giving you some account of events that might not have been that obvious and, and familiar to you. So I owe you a few photographs and I will share them for just for some reason. I can't find them on my phone. They just disappeared, but I will provide. So I owe you a few photographs of the 
of the concert uh, and also how the Yellow Safe Shop looked like during the war. Uh, oh, yes, I need all kinds of gloves, but yeah, this is <laughs> this is all right. So Q and A. So now, well, I know. So there, uh, I'm going to overrun a little bit for those who have time and you have questions that you need answers for. I'm here to answer. So uh, tomorrow, just we're using this opportunity. So tomorrow uh, evening, there will be part three. We start from the same place with the recap, and then we go on. We're going to talk about the water, about the electricity, where people find uh, found those, where people could find more resources, how they would uh, cook food from nothing, and many, many other things. And then there are a lot, lot more tools on my channel, uh, already scheduled, and it's going to be a lot more, and hopefully there will be some real exclusive visits um, in the framework of the siege tours. Thank you everyone for the tipping, for the support, for compassion and tolerance. So the question time. Uh, I'm going through the chat. If I missed the question, feel free to send it again. Thank you, thank you everyone for those words of support. Uh, people went dancing during London Blitz. Yes, exactly, exactly, yes. Indeed, indeed. I'm not saying that the Soviet people were the only who suffered. No, obviously not. The entire Europe suffered. No, no, no. Nothing like that. Uh, the thing that just makes it a little bit stand out just because of the, it's just the, uh, how severe it was and how long it lasted. So uh, it, this is the longest siege of just one single city in history. So, and uh, it's just for us to remember and to never let it happen again. Uh, uh, so where were the rich? Uh, people earn money and people, some people earned a lot, like you could earn, so the average salary was like from 150 uh, rubles, which is the minimum, uh, uh, to 600 rubles. Uh, people would earn money, but there would be not much to spend the money on. So they would be rich. And again, the people who like the bosses, like their superiors, uh, especially the essential superiors of essential um, industries and their um, institutions, they would get a lot. But the head of the medical academy would actually share his double size ratio with workers. So every day he would invite to his office uh, one of his colleagues and would sh they would share that meal. So yes, there, there was there was a gap between the society and people had no idea that just here. So here a person would die, would be dying from hunger, just lying here, and then he would freeze to death. And he wouldn't know that just several steps from him, there were eclairs, pastries, the French pastries. This is it. So this is it. Uh, but who we are to judge? So who we are to judge, right? So, uh, okay, uh, carry on. Again, I don't mean to keep you any longer. So if you need to go, that's totally understand. There are so many awesome tours on Hey Go tonight and just all the time. What was the original purpose of tunnel and shopping center? Peter, thank you for the question. That tunnel uh, was basically used to store the goods to sell. And uh, later on, it was used. Uh, there were also some shops. There was a. There was even a restaurant there. Uh, so it was just used for trade and for storage. Then only for storage in the Soviet times. And then uh, during shelling, it was used as a as a as a uh, uh, well, as a shelter. Aileen, thank you so much. Thank you so much for for your kind words. Susan, thank you so much. It's so great to hear. I'm the best. Well, I'm happy to be working among really the best of the of the of the guides. Hey, go! Thank you so much. Uh, okay, going through the questions. Everyone knows the story of World War II exactly, exactly. But mostly, Karen, thank you. This is a very good comment. But mostly about our own countries, right? Or just countries like related to us the neighboring countries but we don't know much about exactly this is true i mean the story of how the uh, how paris was besieged how the how the blitzkrieg was arranged i mean those stories are 
yes and we don't, i don't know much about that so i really i really want to know more exactly so there, there is so much there's so much there everybody knows but we need to know more we need to and we we probably need to be reminded of that it's a little bit masochistic but i think it, it should be done couldn't the allies air drop supplies uh, the uh, this is a good question so um the thing is no because because the front line was already uh, very far and there was the aviation uh, there was the Nazi aviation and there they they were everywhere so the the easiest way to the uh, to everyone would be to procure the supplies and the road of life and the aircrafts and so the aircraft comes so uh, they try, they tried supplying, they try supplying, but most of it will be destroyed because of the huge, very powerful aviation of the Nazis. Yes. So, and uh, the most of the supplies would, uh, so they were supplies to the other territories, to the free territories of Russia. Yes, uh, the, uh, the allies would help the, well, the land lease thing, obviously, but it was not about Leningrad. Leningrad was besieged and really, 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 uh, let's say in a very difficult position. How aware is the young uh, generation of the siege, Joyce? Uh, so I would say that, uh, especially in, in St. Petersburg, former Leningrad, uh, pretty well aware. Yes. So schools, um, museums try to do everything so the kids would know the past. Um, I can't really speak for the entire country, but when I was a school kid, we were taken to military parades on the, to the, on the 9th of May and the Victory Day. So it's 9th of May in Russia. Uh, and uh, uh, we would, uh, I, I would, as a singer, I used to be a choir girl, so I would sing uh, for the veterans. I remember many veterans. Well, of course, there are very few of them left. Um, yes concerts, parades, but the sad thing that it mostly happens around the date, but during the year, it should have, should have been given more attention during the year too, but uh, memory is kept. Yes, we have the memory. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't be from the beginning. Helped, uh, still, i um, not sure when I will begin, but tomorrow I will, I will provide a recap for, for the past two tours, obviously. Uh, Russians, were, uh, yeah, the Soviet army was good at liberating the camps. We were not the only ones that would liberate the, uh, the concentration camps, but yes. Um, I would say that, well, in Russia, uh, I would say people mostly consider that it was just Russian. It was the Soviet army, it was just Russians who uh, defeated the Nazis. Uh, uh, it was just Russian victory. Um, but Partly it is true, partly not. So I would say that the whole world suffered and the whole world participated. So, and it was like a, the big victory, like the common victory, meaning well, but obviously, so the, 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 the Soviet army, so the, the, just the toll rates. So yeah, so the losses of the Soviet army, the Soviet people, it just incomparable to any other losses, unfortunately. Uh, any other country other than European countries help Russia? Uh, um, I'm, I'm not sure. So, well, uh, I need to look it up, like, uh, what other countries would help. Um, I'm not so sure. So, obviously, some of the countries in Latin America uh, did not help. Well, well, they were allied with the Nazis. So, I just need to look it up. I can't really say now. Thank you for the question. So other than not European countries, I will look it up. Thank you for the question. Uh, my mom tells me all the time how it was during the war. Well, yes, we have to, we have to, we have to know this. Yes, absolutely. But when I was a kid and when my grandma would tell me stories about war, um, I, I wouldn't want to listen and I wish I, I wish I had listened to her more attentively. You only realize it when it's too late, probably, right? Okay, Martha, everyone, thank you so much. Uh, so we were told that it was Russia who won the war for the Allies. 
Margaret, um, yes, we 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 are taught so too. Yes, just well, we need probably think of it in a broader in a, in a more broad spectrum. But yes, uh, absolutely, absolutely. I'm not diminishing. I'm not diminishing any any impact of the Soviet army for sure. Yes, it was our victory, absolutely. So and it was just the world's victory over Nazis. Uh, okay. Thank you, Punkita. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Russia faced three fourths of the German army. Yes, yes, Simon. Absolutely, absolutely. So this is exactly why the the number of the the losses are incomparable. That was that was horrendous. Absolutely. So that's exactly why I'm saying that it is by right that the, uh, that Russia thinks that Russia, the Soviet Union, won the war. Yes. So. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for the questions. I don't mean to keep you any longer. So uh, I'll be posting some of the photographs. So maybe I'll just show them also tomorrow throughout the tour. Uh, thank you for, for your interest. Thank you for the support. Thank you for coming back <laughs> to my tours. And uh, so tomorrow we'll start from, from the same spot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aileen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So really can't thank you enough. So don't mean to keep you any longer. If I missed the question, if I just missed the comment, feel free to find me on Facebook. Feel free to find me on Instagram. I'm Anna, full stop, your guide. I'm sharing lots of content there too. Thank you. See you tomorrow, everyone. And let me just finish up by showing you the beautiful square. And tomorrow we'll talk about how it, how it looked and what was there at the time of siege. Hillary, everyone, thank you. So it's the Ostrovsky Square or the square of the Alexandrinsky Theater is just there behind the monument. That's the monument to Catherine the Great. So tomorrow we're going there, tomorrow night. So make sure you find out that tour on my channel and also join if you're available. So thank you so much, everyone. See you tomorrow. So lest we forget, right? Lest we forget. Bye-bye. Thank you.